Good morning, and we would like to thank you for attending this session that will discuss the needs and requirements of a very important sector in the Arabic economies at uh, this uh, current uh, period of our lives, uh, and that uh, sector cannot be di dissociated from our uh, economy in general. We can say that uh, the economy was behind uh, the current events. Uh, I will quote uh, two signals uh, that have been uh, mentioned by uh, the World Economic Forum that uh, mentions the importance of infrastructure not only in the Arab world, but also uh, throughout the world. It is estimated that uh, every country spends uh, at a lot on infrastructure, and the GDP of that uh, country would go up from 6.5 uh, to uh, 25 cents, and that, uh, that there is a gap uh, between what is being uh, this expenditure on this uh, infrastructure and its requirements is one trillion dollar, and this uh, takes up 1.4 percent of the GDP of the world. Let me go on uh, to a report re prepared by Hani Safi that gives us or shed lights sheds light on the importance of this uh, sector, which is infrastructure. That will happen before. after I uh, welcome uh, Ali Osman Sindhi, Minister of Planning from Kurdistan Regional Government of Iraq, uh, Hassan Haddad, Minister of Tourism of Morocco, Mr. Mohammed Abba, Chairman of Amar Properties uh, in the UAE, Dr. Nasser Marifi, from, uh, who is the Group Chief Executive Officer from Oridi in Qatar, and uh, Mr. Basim Salim, who is the Chairperson or Chairman of the Capital Bank of Jordan. Gentlemen, welcome to all of you, and let's move on immediately to watching our report. من المؤكد أن ثورات الربيع العربي زادت من اهتمام الحكومات بالاستثمار في البنية التحتية كون بعض مشروعات القطاع تمس بشكل مباشر حياة المواطن العربي مثل الكهرباء والبناء والتعليم والصحة والاتصالات والمطارات والموانئ وحتى الطاقة المتجددة affects all sectors of the economy. Middle East or many countries require 75 to 100 billion dollars of investments a year on infrastructure in order to keep and maintain their growth rates that have been achieved throughout the last few years. Given the um, demographic growth, investment in electricity would uh, require at least 30 billion dollars a year to keep up with that uh, growth. Uh, it is well known that investment in infrastructure would also add uh, new job opportunities uh, to the market and that uh, this uh, will uh, attract investors. Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Masqat, uh, Qahira, and uh, Doha have been uh, uh, classified as uh, one of the best, some of the best cities in the world when it comes to infrastructure, particularly electricity grid, uh, water, transport, uh, and airport uh, capabilities. According to Mercedes uh, indicator of 2012 that has uh, covered uh, more than uh, 112 or 221 uh, cities uh, throughout the world. And these uh, cities have expended a lot uh, or spent a lot of money on infrastructure, particularly in uh, the Gulf countries. UAE is the third uh, when it comes to aerial transport. And uh, Dubai also has a lot of uh, advantages when it comes to transport in general. And expenditure on infrastructure is around $200 billion uh, in Doha for the coming 10 years. In Iraq, uh, uh, the Kurdistan uh, regional uh, government has also undertaken a very important or taken very important steps uh, in the development of uh, their infrastructure and infrastructure uh, uh, regulations to attract investment. Uh, economic activities in the Arab countries have improved after 2012. However, there is the dilemma, which is how uh, to um, uh, invest in infrastructure and the need for the involvement of the private sector. It is true that the Gulf countries uh, have exceeded in this uh, respect in the development of infrastructure, but there are 
some countries that have special situations that are trying to come out of uh, destruction, such as Libya and Syria. And the estimated cost of rebuilding uh, the um, infrastructure is around uh, $80 billion uh, coming uh, in the coming two years, according to UN sources. There are other countries uh, that uh, need to uh, rehabilitate their economies, such as uh, uh, Tunisia, Egypt, and Yemen. And uh, the question is thus, uh, what is the role of the banks in uh, sub, uh, supporting the private sector in building or rebuilding uh, the infrastructure? The question, another question is, uh, how much have Arab revolutions uh, changed the scene when it comes to infrastructure? Let me start off uh, with the, that uh, same question. How, how have uh, Arab revolutions changed the requirements of infrastructures in the Arab world? And this is a question that I would like to address to all of the speakers. I will start off with you, Your Excellency, the Minister. Two minutes, please, per person. Good morning, Maya. I think that the priorities in spite of the changes that have taken place in the MENA region, priorities have not changed. When we talk about the role of the private sector in infrastructure, uh, the same priorities still stand, uh, the same priorities of uh, the previous uh, period. Maybe there are uh, some exacerbation, maybe there are some uh, extra uh, needs or requirements, uh, but uh, the same uh, forecasts are uh, when it comes uh, to the needs of the infrastructure. We know that uh, demographic growth, for example, in Maine, is on the average uh, 2%, and that is the maximum expected growth. If we compare this with the economic development or growth uh, of uh, countries that uh, export uh, uh, oil, uh, or that import uh, oil, sorry, is 2%, and for those that export, 7%. So it is clear. Uh, our equation is clear. If we look at uh, unemployment rates as well and compare them, to what uh, they stood at uh, three or four years ago, these rates might be the main buttress or the main reason that have led to the changes that swept the region. The basic reason uh, were those chronic uh, reasons, uh, unemployment, unemployment amongst the, the youth uh, of the age category 15 to 25 years old. In uh, Kurdistan, uh, in Iraq, our situation is slightly different. The changes have started in 2003. There are some positive indicators. The, there is openness uh, towards uh, various uh, modern uh, tools uh, and uh, methods. And maybe when it comes to unemployment or economic growth, our figures are uh, better than others in the region. In Kurdistan, Iraq, uh, unemployment is 7.4 percent, uh, not more than that. That does not mean that uh, we are not ambitious and that we would uh, seek uh, more uh, stability and better improvement. Excellency Minister Lahsan Haddad, do you think that this sector changed after the Arab Spring? Well, there is a difference between the Gulf countries, the uh, oil exporting countries, and the oil importing countries. I think there is a difference in terms of investment in infrastructure. Countries like Morocco have invested a lot in infrastructure, a lot of investments in the past 10 years, but on different levels. There are the big projects that we uh, called structural projects that have an impact on the uh, economic, uh, on the dynamics of economy in certain regions or on the level of the country as a whole. And then there are projects that create connectivity and uh, networking between the different regions and also with the world. And uh, these are some important uh, projects as well. There are other projects that uh, have a social dimension like uh, electricity, outreach to remote areas, to uh, rural areas, uh, and these are all also important. After the so-called Arab Spring, I don't think there has been a big change in this regard, but there is a pressure on the public budget and uh, increasing pressure on uh, uh, financing, and I think uh, that it is unlikely 
that uh, the big projects, or it is likely that the big projects uh, will slow down because there's a lot of pressure on social uh, projects. Uh, and now there is a political uh, dimension because uh, governments are trying to meet the social demands to decrease uh, demonstrations and to create a kind of uh, peaceful situation in the country. Infrastructure is extremely important. And uh, investments in infrastructure have led to growth in uh, several countries, including Morocco. What we need to work on now is to focus on the infrastructure that will enable us to respond to the aspirations of the people, uh, infrastructure investments that create uh, job opportunities and create sustainable development locally and regionally. Mr. Mohamed Labar, I don't think the question is whether there is a change in interest uh, in uh, infrastructure development after the Arab Spring. I think the most important question is, during this change, uh, I think we are moving uh, to a new kind of government. Uh, I call it Democracy 101. And the question is whether there will be new regimes, and if there are new regimes, I think they will want to improve the infrastructure and to improve the living conditions for people in the Arab world. However, the painful example, if we look at the United States, which is a model of democracy in the world, we have the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States. There are only two political parties. If we look at the Arab world and the new democracies in the Arab world, the, in the United States, uh, with the Democrats and the Republicans, I think they have reached a point where the uh, government, uh, the American government, uh, stops functioning one year before the elections because of the fiscal cliff. In the Arab world, we have 14 political parties, or uh, at best maybe five political parties, and then there is a lot of fighting between these political parties. In the United States and Britain, it took them uh, tens of years to learn how to have a democratic system. Unless we have a regime that uses the Mandela model, that is very responsive, that focuses on unity and cooperation. The danger that I see now is that the new regimes may have all the good intentions in the world, but to learn how to govern and rule democratically and to have political parties that can agree uh, and reach consensus for the interests of the people, this might take us 70 years to reach that point, to learn this. And I think this will have a negative impact on the infrastructure. The last important point that I want to make is that we cannot talk about infrastructure only. We need to also look at the technology and how it has impacted and changed uh, people. Is the new, will the new investments in infrastructure help us to move uh, the Arab population to another level, the level that the, whole, uh, the rest of the world has reached. If it's going to take us 70 years, uh, this will be too slow. We'll talk about uh, technology uh, and sustainability, uh, particularly in this sector, in this session, but it will be later. Dr. Nasser, I'd like to hear your opinion about this question. Well, I agree with what uh, my predecessors have said, but I think that there are other uh, challenges. If we look at the telecommunications sector, for example, and based on the report that we just heard, uh, the Gulf countries are very advanced in infrastructure and their growth pace is uh, very fast, especially in terms of adapting to technological developments. If we look at uh, telecommunications, it represents about 5.5% of the GDP of Arab countries about $132 billion a year, and it is expected that this, this investment, if it is properly invested, that it will lead to an increase of $100 billion in the next five years and create 6 million new job opportunities. However, what we see in the region is that there is a slow investment in infrastructure, especially in certain Arab countries. If we look at the, uh, what is happening in Arab countries in terms of telecommunications, there's, there are huge developments in the uh, recent period, and the uh, spread is about 100% in terms of uh, cellular phone use in the Arab countries. However, there is a delay in uh, digital technology, especially internet services. They are the equivalent of 13% uh, 
in the Arab countries, 13% of the regions are connected uh, to the internet, and this is due to uh, the fact that certain countries have been very slow in attracting foreign investments and in ensuring the participation of the private sector, as well as uh, presenting opportunities and also the necessary licenses. Uh, if we look at other countries in the region, they don't. Many of them don't have the G3, third generation services, and now we're talking about uh, 4G. So, and this is very slow. And we know that the telecommunications sector is, stimulates the other sectors. It affects the uh, financial sectors, education, and health. So, it is very essential to invest in this sector because, as I said, it will be um, very good. Uh, it will have good impact on the other sectors. Uh, Mr. Bassem is Salem. The topic of the Arab Spring obviously had an impact on investments and infrastructure, and this impact has been negative in the sense that with, despite the importance of these investments and the importance of infrastructure, and investing in infrastructure in particular, we find that there is a, a shift in the path of these investments because today we are no longer talking about the role of the private sector. The role of the private sector as a stimulant for economic growth has become simply as a partner in this process is questionable today. And I believe that this trend is negative. And the reason is that regulations were not clear in the past. The involvement of uh, the private sector in infrastructure developments needed or requires re-evaluation because we need to look at the private sector as the engine for growth, as the stimulus for growth. In the Gulf countries, they don't have a problem with uh, financing these projects. However, if there is no role for the private sector in such projects, this will mean that the Arab Spring will result in increasing pressure on public budgets uh, in more popular demands that will transform countries like Jordan into a welfare state. And this means that the governments will no longer be able to invest in infrastructure development. So we need to revisit the regulations and basis for the involvement of private sector as the uh, engine for growth. We will talk about private sector and uh, regulations and laws, uh, but uh, Minister Ali Sindi, you said that the priorities have not changed and Kurdistan might be a model for a country that requires a lot of infrastructure development in all sectors. In your opinion, after the, I believe that uh, perhaps uh, the uh, Arab revolutions were based on social demands, improving the living conditions uh, and uh, general conditions uh, in the countries. When developing infrastructure, what are the priorities that you take into consideration to serve the people, and how can the government? change uh, or channel the investments uh, for infrastructure, and you have been a, a focus for uh, investments in infrastructure, how can you channel them according to the needs of the people, not the interests of the investors? Let me start by saying that the region as a whole, including Iraq and uh, Kurdistan and Iraq, the whole region needed electricity, and we still need electricity. And we have not met this need uh, completely in the MENA region. According to the most recent report of the World Bank uh, regarding the developmental situation in the MENA region, electricity and road networks are still basic needs, in addition to water, uh, sanitation, and the quality of health and educational services still need a lot of uh, development. As I said at the beginning, we need to look at this as a need uh, that you existed before but has been exacerbated now, and it might be aggravated even further in the future because of the population growth as well as the policies uh, that are applied in Kurdistan, Iraq. We focus on two issues. First, on the gap in infrastructure that we need to fill. First, we need to measure and quantify this gap and define it and say this is the gap. We are not talking, we cannot talk in general and say there is a gap in infrastructure and without having somebody 
specifying exactly what is missing, and then based on that, develop a plan to fill this gap and then connect it with the development of the private sector in terms of hardware and software through legislation, as uh, Basim has just mentioned. In Kurdistan, the basic need in infrastructure, the basic infrastructure that will serve the growth of the private sector in the future, we estimate that this need based on a report uh, that we prepared at the end of 2012 after working six uh, months with international teams uh, is estimated at $33 billion. This is what we need now for our infrastructure, and this is what we need to focus and work on. Our average expenditures in the government to cover this need ranges between 2 to $3 billion annually in the past four years. We spent this amount on infrastructure, so we need the help of the private sector. And we have opened the doors, and we need to uh, do more opening uh, of doors for public-private partnership, but we need more legislation. On this point, if you permit me, I would like to ask Mr. Mohamed Labar, the uh, financing gap that uh, His Excellency uh, spoke about uh, covers the whole region, as we saw in the report. How can the private sector fill this gap? And do you think that uh, the dialogue between the public and private sector has matured enough to ensure that they undertake this role? Certainly, the private sector wishes to participate, has a will to participate and work, but if there is no clear policy on the part of the government, if there is no uh, sustainable regime that is homogeneous, that is uh, stable, as private sector, we cannot work uh, under these conditions. We know that opportunities in the Arab region are prime opportunities, and uh, there is a need, there is demand, but if the structure of the government and the country is not stable, we cannot work there. These are new regimes. They have not stabilized yet. They do not have the experience of dealing with political parties working together. We hope that they will reach that uh, point. This is a danger. Currently, we are working in Kurdistan. Uh, it's very effective, very efficient, because the government is very well organized. And I'm not saying this because Dr. Ali is here. This is why we're investing in Kurdistan. We are investing in all Arab countries, but there are still Arab countries that we'd like to invest in, but they still have problems with decision-making in the government. They have a lot of uh, strife, uh, political strife, and this has a negative impact on our work and on all the kinds of activities and future projects that can be undertaken in these countries. Dr. Nasser, the issue of new regimes and the long time that it takes uh, for them to develop their work, how can we activate this dialogue between private sector and public sector, and how can governments uh, take decisions that will prompt this dialogue, especially in light of the lack of political stability and uh, the fact that there are still, there's still some fighting in certain countries. How can we start this? Uh, what kind of measures can be taken? This is essential if the private sector wishes to take part in the development of infrastructure in Arab countries. And I believe that uh, in telecommunications in particular, we suffer a lot from the ambiguity of laws and legislation, especially after we started investing, we found that governments start to submit new laws or uh, constraints on investment and new taxes that did not exist when we started investing. In the telecommunications sector in particular, we need a long time for uh, installing infrastructure and it requires a lot of investment. So we need clarity on the long run, clarity in legislations and policies to encourage investment in these countries. Another important point is that we need regulatory frameworks for these uh, sectors. Uh, the telecommunications uh, sector in several countries do not have a regulatory framework uh, to regulate the relationship between the competing uh, companies or between them and the government in case of conflict on certain issues. And this is necessary. And if in the Arab countries we have not reached uh, uh, a point where we have uh, very well developed uh, policies and frameworks. I think uh, promoting investment requires stability, political stability, and also stability in uh, rules and uh, laws and legislations. Uh, Mr. Bassem, from the perspective of the private sector, what are the gaps uh, in terms of laws and legislations, particularly when the private sector 
works beyond their own country and tries to invest in uh, new and emerging markets. And you have an experience in Iraq in particular that you can perhaps talk about. Yes, we have an investment in Iraq as a capital bank and in, we invest in Jordan. Legislations in Jordan are very clear, especially in the banking sector. And we have a solid banking sector with the central bank. The central bank has been functioning since 1962. All legislations are very clear and we have, we can say uh, humbly that we do have a solid banking sector. From our experience in Iraq and legislation in Iraq, I think there's still ambiguity there. It's not very clear. The presence of the banking sector in Iraq, well, I can say that it doesn't exist. 90% of uh, Deposits are in government banks and 10% in private banks. This does not allow for financing projects, whether infrastructure projects or for the private sector on the level of SMEs, small and medium enterprises. The percentage of uh, financing of the private sector from the GDP is no more than 10%. And if we compare it with other countries where it can reach 80 to 120%, so, in fact, legislation in Iraq uh, is still very weak. It needs to be solidified and provide more opportunities for private banks to uh, invite more uh, deposits uh, to enable investment. Uh, Iraq uh, has uh, is a very rich country. It has regular income from the oil sector. There's a lot of potential, as the minister said, whether in Kurdistan or in Iraq as a whole, from Basra to Baghdad and all other uh, parts of Iraq. So legislations are extremely important. They need to be improved uh, to enable, for example, the establishment of uh, investment funds. And this also applies to Jordan. To have investment funds, we need clear legislation to uh, allow for uh, the entry and exit of investors uh, into investment funds in these countries and other Arab countries as well. We need to work a lot on that. On the topic of financing, we're always talking about creativity and new uh, financing uh, tools uh, or instruments. What are the new instruments uh, that are needed to develop this sector in this region? And how can we benefit uh, from the uh, good uh, conditions in the financial markets uh, in the Gulf and other Arab countries and uh, the liquidity to serve uh, this sector? Well, if you look at the most recent uh, numbers, the first quarter of 2013, the total uh, bonds uh, for infrastructure in Asia reached $17 billion. That's an increase of 50% from the previous year. However, unfortunately, in the Arab uh, world, the, these capitals exist in the Arab world. But can we issue bonds or finance uh, 20 billion in one quarter? Unfortunately, the, question, the answer is no. Why? Because there is no stability. Today, as a bank or as an issuer of a bond, I need to look at the project. Uh, I need to look at the country where I'm investing. If there's no stability, if uh, I don't know what their policies are, if the legislation is not clear, if I cannot cooperate with them, I have to go back to the point that I made before. We have new regimes, new political parties. Unfortunately, we can't know whether these governments know how to cooperate with the private sector. We cannot tell what their policies will be. So as an investor, as uh, someone who has capital, for this capital to be invested, I need stability. I need stability in policies. I need clarity in legislation. Unfortunately, Asia is attracting these investments, while the Arab uh, region cannot, because there are no clear policies. We don't have qualified people to manage these institutions. The governments uh, are like the uh, private sector. You need a, a structure. Uh, you need a qualified people. And the answer is no. Dr. Nasser, to which extent is the funding problem becoming a challenge in the region? I don't think that there is a lack in financial resources. And I know that there is a problem when it comes to the stability of regimes and the need for clarity 
when it comes to the future. Now, the infrastructure in the Arab world is underdeveloped, especially when it comes to the uh, to digital economies. As you know, we live in a global village, and we need services, global services, that are capable of being provided throughout the world. And if we do not become developed in this field, then we will miss our opportunity. We, you have heard what my colleague just said about Asia. You have seen the numbers that he has provided. And if you look at how digital services are spreading in the Arab world, you will see that their spread is only about 13% of their spread in Asia and in developed countries. We have the, the resources, but we need to attract more investments, and we need to encourage investors to come to our countries and to invest there, because investors need to be sure that they will have um, gains from their investments. And that is why we need a clear systems, we need to be able to attract investments. For the time being, the situation is very ambiguous, and we are not quite capable of attracting those investments. Mr. Bassam, what is meant when we say that we need more creative financial tools? And do you think that the banking system is capable of providing those creative financial tools to overcome the challenges that your colleagues have talked about. Yes, I believe they can, the system can indeed create these creative financial tools. However, as you have said, and as everybody has said, we feel that the situation is unstable in the region. This instability is due to the Arab Spring, is due to the fact that we have new governments, governments whose vision is not clear as yet. Do those governments want to focus on what is known as big government, or do they want to give more opportunities to the private sector? We have financial resources in the Gulf states and in other Arab states, and we can use those financial resources to achieve our aims. I believe that the governments need to play a bigger role. They need to provide support. They need to provide incentives to the private market in order for it to help in the creation of those new financial tools. I believe that the situation is a no-brainer. This is what happened in other parts of the world, and this is what can happen in our region, too. However, my colleague Mohammed said that there is a lack of, a lack of stability. Maybe it is not a lack of, stab of political stability, but it's a lack of uh, legislative stability, at least. We in Jordan, we have drafted a new law when it comes to income tax. As you know, we are a country that does not have a lot of financial resources, and we thought that a way to support the private sector would be by increasing uh, taxes. And now, Everybody is calling for an increase in taxes on banks and on individuals and on companies. And I believe that if we do not do so, we will not be ab able to invest in the infrastructure, infrastructure sector or in any other structure. And the private sector would never want to invest in these sectors. I believe that our governments, especially richer governments, need to use the huge resources that they have in order to drive great and huge infrastructure resources, infrastructure projects in their countries. Mr. Haddad, uh, Morocco has invested greatly in its infrastructure in the past few years. It has increased those investments a lot, and I believe that you have attracted new investments in this uh, sector. Have you tried to think about new or creative financial tools? I would like to make a few comments beforehand. I believe that governments need to have a clear vision. The legislation, the laws need to be very clear. We need to provide a conducive environment for investments by providing the necessary laws, the necessary tools, and the tribunals that are needed in this sector. However, I believe that we need to ensure that the private sector is mature enough, even in Gulf states, to be able to support governments in this field. This transitional period that we are witnessing is actually a period where the private sector and the public sector can cooperate in order to achieve and to realize their projects. Sometimes the private sector depends on the public sector and vice versa. I believe when it comes to funding, I believe that we need creative 
tools and creative remedies. For example, in Morocco, sometimes there are contracts, joint contracts between the government and between private or public companies in order to build certain projects. Sometimes we have cooperation and partnerships between private and public companies when it comes to structural projects, very complicated, very complex projects that need a lot of money and that need a lot of time to be achieved. I believe that in this case, we do need this cooperation and that the government has to issue new rules, new laws to govern this cooperation and this relationship between the public and private sectors. We also need investment funds. We in Morocco, we have established a very important tourism investment fund. Uh, it's very important. It uh, cooperates with sovereign funds in Gulf states. We also have a fund for infrastructure, a fund for industrial startups. And all these projects are very important, and they are built on cooperation between the public and the private sector. We have seen all these projects in Morocco, and they have helped us achieve uh, a lot of progress in Morocco. For example, the public sector can sometimes delegate some projects to the private sector, and the private sector would invest in those projects that have been delegated to it. And this, of course, would lead to many gains to that sector. We need to build on all those mechanisms. However, what we need to focus on is funding uh, through the stock exchange. We need to work with the stock exchange. We need to use all the mechanisms within stock exchange markets. I think that in Gulf states, they have managed to use stock, their stock exchanges in a better way. We in Morocco have not reached such advanced levels yet. And of course, the political environment is very important. There are many companies that work in countries where there is a lack of political stability, and they are achieving gains there. Companies can work even when there is a lack of political stability. There needs to be a certain limit of political stability, of course. And I believe that we are quite capable of investing and of continuing to work in those countries and investing in those countries where uh, which lack political stability. I do not agree with you. I believe that if there is no political stability, I myself, as a representative of a huge company, I cannot really go and make plans about plans to invest in countries which lack political stability. If I draw up such projects, I would never receive the funding. I would never receive the green light from my board of directors. I believe that any company would like to invest its money in a conducive environment, in a country that is stable, in a country where the leadership is quite known and clear. Unfortunately, um, or fortunately for you, in Morocco, the situation is quite different. You uh, have a very stable uh, country. You have a wise king. And you have a conducive environment. You have a clear leadership that has a clear vision. However, this situation is not the same in other countries. I believe that the fact that uh, there is no stability would prevent us from investing in some countries. I would like to say something about political stability. It is true that we in Morocco, we enjoy political stability, and there are many investments coming to Morocco from Arab states and from other states. However, there are a number of countries that have witnessed revolutions, but that have not achieved yet full political stability, such as Egypt, such as Tunisia. And I believe that those countries are on their way to stability, and they can attract investments, even if they are not one. 100% uh, stable yet. Uh, Mr. Ali Sindi, you are witnessing many developments, and the stability is not ensured 100%. But have you been able to make many achievements in your country in order to keep abreast with the developments taking place in your country? Yes, I'd like to talk about Kurdistan, because the situation in Kurdistan is different from the situation in Baghdad or in other parts of Iraq. We, in Kurdistan, we have a government. Ever since 1992, we've had this government, and we've had a parliament. Ever since 2003, we've become part of 
of the changes witnessed by Iraq. Uh, following 2003, we are part of the situation, of the general situation in Iraq. We have a parliament in Kurdistan, and of course, any uh, laws that are adopted by the parliament need to be endorsed. We have a number of people in the parliament who are part of the opposition and who are giving us a very hard time for us in the government, for us ministers, especially when it comes to legislations or to laws about the budget, about investment budgets or operational budgets. The situation is not easy in Kurdistan. However, there are always solutions for our problems. These solutions might not be ideal all the time. However, I would like to repeat that we need to take the situation as it is. There are needs in Kurdistan and in other countries, and the governments need to be quite clear with themselves and with their populations. They need to tackle their needs and to tackle their problems in the right way, we have solutions and we have remedies that need to be presented clearly to everybody. We need investments, investments for the private sector so that the private sector can take part in this building process. Of course, this needs infrastructure. When I say infrastructure, I don't just mean roads and streets. However, I, I, also, need, I also mean banks and legislations and a conducive legislative environment. Now, these problems are chronic. And some of these obstacles are not only linked to political or security stability. It, uh, they are also linked to some facts that are not conducive to the private sector. The private sector sometimes shies away from investing in our countries because maybe the gains are not so clear or are not so big. So what are the measures that can be taken? The governments could maybe guarantee certain gains for the private sector when the private sector takes part in building the infrastructure, especially in those sectors that are not usually attractive for the private sector. There are some investments with clear gains and clear profit, and I believe that the private sector can invest in all those fields, in all those projects. We need to make sure that the private sector realizes what profits it can achieve. We need to guarantee those uh, profits. When it comes to roads, when it comes to schools, when it comes to health or, health or educational systems, the private sector can invest in all those fields. In Jordan, for example, you have a great health system. We in Kurdistan, when we want to uh, think about improving our health systems, we take Jordan as an example. And when we want to invest in other fields, we take other countries as, as example. When it comes to governance, I believe that we need to learn lessons from the experiences of other countries. For example, experiences from Singapore, experiences from other countries that have witnessed success stories. We also need to focus, or governments need to focus on another thing which is decentralization. This is what was done by Morocco. Morocco has endorsed decentralization, especially when it comes to, develop, to the development of the different regions in Morocco. I believe that we need to engage the different regions and governorates in, a, in one country to engage them in the development process. This would boost the development process in those countries. Now, everything that was said uh, here is known, it is true. Now we need to think more carefully and we need to walk the talk. It is no longer about having uh, uh, slogans or carrying slogans, it's about walking the talk. We are witnessing a, an information revolution and we need to cope and to adapt to that uh, revolution. Mr. Mohammed, the minister has talked about an exchange of experiences and maybe it it uh, leads us to talk about uh, regional integration. Do you think that regional integration is possible nowadays? 
or it is not realistic to talk about regional integration. I believe that regional integration and regional cooperation is not realistic until now. We still have problems within the Arab, uh, Arab world. We still have problems inside each and every Arab country. We need to focus on those problems. We need to solve them. We need to promote uh, the private sector in our countries. And then maybe later on we can think about cooperation, regional cooperation. I believe that uh, there is a huge gap between the living standards in the Arab world and the living standards in other countries in the world. This is a huge gap. And maybe we need to focus on our problems in the Arab world instead of talking about integration and cooperation. Of course, integration and cooperation are needed, but the reality on the ground is quite different. And maybe each and every Arab country has to focus on its own internal situation over the coming 10 or 15 years. We need to ensure that those uh, these countries, those governments are capable of cooperating maybe 10 or 15 years later, because the population will come and ask the governments, what have you done for us? What have you been able to do for us over these long years? We're talking about uh, technological developments. We know that uh, the Arab population now has communication tools, enjoys communication tools, and is quite capable of toppling its uh, government regimes uh, very quickly. So our governments need to focus on these matters, and I wish them all success. However, when it comes to regional integration, it's something that we can tackle later on in the future. Mr. Nasser, do you believe uh, that uh, the telecommunication sector has witnessed many developments and have helped uh, bridge that gap? I believe that the communication sector has played a major role in the region. If you look at the past 10 years, you'd see that uh, the number of people who have uh, cell phones has increased from 20 million people in 2002 to 100 million people in 2011. However, there is a gap when it comes to digital services. Those dig digital services are very important in the future, as you all know. There are a number of important steps that we need to take in the future. And we need to engage the private sector in a dialogue with the public sector, as well as with regulatory bodies, in order to attract investments and in order to provide incentives to the private sector so that it would invest in these new digital tools and digital services. I believe that many people think that uh, the telecommunication sector is a very profitable one, but this is not uh, tr entirely true. We need huge investments, huge investments not only when it comes to cell phone networks, but also huge investments when it comes to di digital services in general. And I believe that governments need to cover the necessary tools for in, in their countries, including the third and fourth generation, and including the necessary frequencies for the operation of these high technological tools. And unfortunately, we in the Arab world, we have not invested enough money in this field. The telecommunication sector is going to be a driver for other sectors. You. Uh, you know that uh, the spread of cell phones increases the GDP, and uh, we need to increase the spread of digital services too. If uh, digital services increase in the future, it, it would mean that the GDP in our countries will increase between 4 and 5 percent in the coming 5 or 10 years. So there are huge opportunities. But we need more investments, and we need this partnership between public and private sectors in order to draft the necessary policies in this field. Dr. Nasser, when it comes to smart technologies, when it comes to renewable energy resources, do you think that these two issues are important and help us to build the infrastructure in our countries? Yes, of course. Smartphones, smart technology, and renewable energies are very important. 
We have about 30 million smartphones in the Arab world, which is a very limited number. And we believe that the number of smartphones will increase in the future. However, we need the necessary infrastructure that would enable us to increase the number of smartphones being used in the Arab world. We have opportunities. We need to make use of uh, opportunities in the Arab world and opportunities in the world. We have many opportunities in the world, and we need, as Arab countries, to take part and to use those opportunities, which we do not necessarily have in the Arab world. For example, we have financial services that are provided through cell phones. These financial services through cell phones are not provided in the Arab world. They are only provided in a number of Gulf countries, maybe, but not in other Arab countries. And I believe that we need to to focus on this issue. We need to issue the necessary licenses to enable those smartphones to spread and to enable those financial tools to, tools to spread through cell phones. Minister Haddad, you in Morocco, you have attracted a lot of investments, especially in the field of renewable energy, investments from the Arab, from the World Bank and from the IMF, and also from Abu Dhabi. Those investments, have they really provided support to the infrastructure sector in Morocco? Yes. When it comes to value added uh, and uh, when it comes to telecommunications, uh, there has been a revolution that has taken place in uh, Morocco when it comes to the use of uh, cellular phones in particular, and that has uh, led to the creation of many job opportunities. However, the government was heavily involved in uh, creating in the investment of this uh, uh, sector in order to create all these opportunities. We have to bridge uh, the digital uh, gap uh, between the Arab countries and developed countries in order to be able to use uh, the fourth uh, generation when it comes to digital technology. This is very important. This will add value and add job opportunities. It is a very promising sector uh, for uh, the job market uh, and for renewable energy. Arab, uh, the Arab world has uh, enormous uh, renewable energy capabilities when it comes to water uh, and solar energy. And this is due to two reasons. The fact that uh, we, we are spending at least 4 to 5 percent of our GDP because of the lack of investment of in renewable energies. If we invest in renewable energies, we will be able to improve our GDP. The other reason is that uh, Europe uh, relies on renewable energy, and it has a very ambitious program which aims at uh, the usage of 20% uh, of its energy uh, by relying on the renewable energy. So the southern countries of the, Mid of the Mediterranean can have a lot of potential in this respect. Uh, Moroccan Morocco and the North African countries have investments uh, that amount to around uh, $1 billion, $100 billion or $10 billion. Uh, in order to create uh, around 2,000 megawatt of solar energy and 2,000 uh, from the wind energy and to export some of that uh, energy because Morocco itself will not use all that uh, energy, produced energy from the uh, solar and wind energies. Uh, but there are some problems when it comes to the uh, hard currency and when it comes to entrepreneurship and subcontracting and contracting that are, that are involved in such sectors. Which sectors will benefit from this plan, sir? Well, I think the uh, sectors will be mainly transport, uh, tourism, because we know that there is uh, an international uh, uh, tendency or trend and uh, towards uh, tourism and the use of alternative energy. Tourists are interested in going to uh, green areas or to areas that uh, are heavily dependent on renewable energy. Uh, farming and agriculture will also benefit from solar energy. In addition to that, uh, there are the water projects. Uh, we know that uh, in Morocco and the Arab countries in general, uh, we are on the verge of uh, facing a very heavy crisis when it comes to water and water uh, requirements. Uh, investment should be in desalination and the reuse of water uh, when it comes to building uh, dams. All these issues will require investment in renewable energy. Yes, sir. Uh, Hamad, would you like to uh, give us your view? Yes.
I think we have to uh, be careful. When we say that uh, half of our uh, Arab uh, um, populations uh, are composed of uh, the youth, we need to focus on uh, developing uh, the way they think uh, these young people, whether they are uh, men or women, because they, their lives are completely different than our lives today. We know when it comes to infrastructure and infrastructure in technology and IT, all this is related to the uh, readability of the mentality uh, of the Arab youth uh, to use such IT. We know that there is a, a, an increase in e-commerce in the Arab world. Uh, maybe we are uh, uh, the first in the world. Uh, uh, this uh, increase is around 45 uh, percent, uh, and this ha huge and speedy increase uh, is related to the fact that the population is very young and that there has been some in infrastructure investment. Uh, again, I say the use of IT and its spread is very important in the Arab world. If we want uh, our infrastructure to be able to improve the standard of Arab youth and Arab citizens uh, to uh, tally with international levels, we have to focus focus on how to invest in IT uh, on very sound basis. And we have to increase, focus on developing the mentality of uh, the young people in the Arab countries. This is very important, uh, the minister. Yes, this is very important. Uh, we might think that uh, the IT is going to create uh, job opportunities only, but that might not be true if it is not capable of attracting uh, many young people who are interested in IT. Interest in IT and in digital technology would be linked to that development of that mentality and would attract uh, many young people in this uh, sector. This would indeed create many job opportunities in the Arab world. The minister from uh, Kurdistan, uh, if we look at the financing uh, methodologies uh, or methods and regulations, uh, we need to uh, be careful. When we talk about uh, IT or technology, I think it is better to talk about means and methods because uh, if we talk about uh, methods uh, when it comes to technology or uh, telecommunications, uh, it is very important how import how uh, the use of that uh, IT can be. Uh, but when we talk about education and the human resources, uh, we also need to know how to use uh, the IT. Uh, around 50% of our population in Kurdistan uh, is uh, of the age category less than 20 years old. Is the segment that is very important to us. Uh, it is true that the unemployment rate is uh, low in Kurdistan, but it is uh, spread out uh, in uh, the entire world and not only in Iraq or in Kurdistan. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, educational methods should focus on this core issue. And I mean by that education for employment. We should focus on uh, this type of education, how to educate our youth uh, to be able to participate in the creation and building of uh, the infrastructure. If we look at this uh, topic from another angle, we're talking about uh, generation of power, of electricity, uh, provision of clear water, uh, sewerage, uh, sewage uh, services, all these issues are uh, needed, but uh, let, we have to admit that even in countries where such services are uh, there, we need to uh, focus on uh, quality and effectiveness. It is not only a matter of uh, um, availing the technology, but we need to uh, make sure that there isn't a lot of waste uh, uh, in those countries that have the appropriate uh, technologies. In Kurdistan, Iraq, uh, we have sufficient water resources. We have more than 1,800 uh, kilometers, square kilometers of of water cube in Kurdistan because of the various uh, rivers. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be frank and say that uh, the way that uh, the water is used is not the most effective. That's why I say we need to review all these points. Uh, these are simple points, uh, but they have to be reviewed uh, and tackled. It is not only focusing on major shifts when it comes to IT. Generation of power or electricity through uh, the solar or wind energies. Uh, this might happen uh, with 
uh, the presence of oil and gas, or it can be not. Uh, it can be unfeasible uh, from a, an economic point of view. Again, I say we have to focus on the way we use that energy, how to distribute it, how to control it. All these points are uh, points uh, to be taken into consideration. Uh, we also need uh, to look at certain percentages when it comes or rates when it comes to our expenditure, national income. National income needs to be based on uh, specific equations. Uh, in the coming 10 years, uh, we know that the infrastructure needs a lot of support and a lot of expenditure, and maybe each uh, billion dollars would create 40 to uh, 50 or 100,000 uh, new jobs uh, on an annual basis. Uh, but we also need to know that uh, we need to have fixed certain rates uh, uh, or equations uh, from the GDP expenditure that would support infrastructure. Yes, sir, you, uh, Mr. Abari has mentioned this point, and uh, he mentioned the fact that we need to support entrepreneurs and the youth in order to contribute in the infrastructure. I need to tackle this issue very quickly. Mr. Mohammed Abari, UAE might be the most uh, progressive or advanced in supporting uh, SMEs and entrepreneurs because we know that they are uh, the sectors that uh, um, um, uh, provides incentive to the economy. Is it a matter of, of lack of confidence in uh, the uh, youth uh, that does not lead to further development? Mr. Abbar, I think that uh, our previous speaker have mentioned a very important point, which is education. Investment in education is very important. Uh, investment in the mentality, in the way the youth peep and the people in general think. Uh, this is the difference between the Arab countries and uh, Europe or Western, the Western world. The UAE, for example, has adopted a very uh, distinguished uh, educational system and the political environment in the UAE had also played uh, a positive role because the UAE is stable uh, and everybody aspires at a better education. So this point is important. Secondly, we need to have uh, our on the UAE, we had uh, leaders uh, who were interested in uh, youth uh, programs, and that has happened. Uh, we saw many sheikhs or many uh, leaders who were interested in the youth and uh, provided many incentives uh, uh, to the youth. Uh, this happens in the US, UAE as well as in other countries. And I think at the end of the day, it is the responsibility of governments, so whether we're talking about country A or B, it is the governments that are uh, uh, in control of following up on uh, such uh, policies, and this, uh, of course, uh, affects uh, how successful the youth are. We're talking about 50 percent of the Arab population, and uh, uh, we should have involved uh, more young people on this panel in order to give us uh, a clearer view about the uh, situation in uh, those countries. Uh, mm. Ms. Maya, we have uh, one minute left. Uh, can you give us just uh, one comment? Uh, Your Excellency, uh, the Minister, yes, we need to review the educational curricula in order to support uh, the inclusion or the involvement of the private sector in the investment and in the development of infrastructure. Uh, yes, we need democracy. There are major uh, political uh, changes, uh, but uh, democracy is the most important because democracy does not mean uh, laissez-faire uh, or uh, uh, complete freedom. No, it means a sharing of responsibility. Mr. Uh, Al-Abbar, we need to speed up action. We need to learn how to um, adopt uh, governance very quickly, and we need to get rid of totalitarian regimes, which is not very easy to achieve. Dr. Nasser, I think that there is a need to involve the uh, private sector and to have PPPs and to uh, include the private sector in uh, the regulation uh, or legislation to uh, attract uh, investment. Uh, Mr. Bassam, we need to, uh, to have proper legislation that would promote the uh, role of uh, the private sector investment in investment in the infrastructure and uh, to focus on uh, the job creation because unemployment is our major uh, problem. Ms. Maya, so the private sector has always been uh, our focus and PPPs are always uh, very important. I would like to thank our guests uh, and the speakers and we're sorry because we did not have sufficient time to take questions yeah, from the audience. Thank you.